yes i have answered all the question in this interview so hey folks my name is ravish and welcome back to another video in the series of devops real time interviews now we have a profile with us today so this person was having some sort of internship experience uh, less than six months or around a year and i have treated him as a fresher uh, the question asked were from uh, basic level so this can be considered as devops fresher interview the person uh, had worked on aws related services so i have concentrated more on that and the project that i did uh, i started with roles and responsibilities and to explain the project the person has worked on jenkins and aws related service like cloudwatch acm ec2 efs a bit on git and grafana uh, and uh, about monitoring as well so i have uh, laid a bit of emphasis on that all right so that would be about in the today's interview and if you're new over here and seeing me for the first time my name is ravish and i create content for devops and cloud related stuff kindly subscribe the channel because that would really support me to create more content like this. all right so without further ado let's get started um so yeah uh, can you just uh, walk me through your current roles and responsibilities okay my current organization we do more monitoring with grafana then most sometimes I also manage their Kubernetes cluster, whereby we do a lot of um, deployment. Okay, so uh, like, what exactly is your project? What do you do in your project? Well, we handle um, deployments, apps, and um, application web application. Whereby we get we get the images, we deploy them on. We set up the Kubernetes plus like using AWS, then and from there we set up the clusters, place them, set up the YAML file and all that, deploy them with the load balancers. But most of the time we use the ingress controller because we have multiple load balancer causes a lot of expenses for the organization. So we route everything through an ingress controller. So with the multiple balancers and we always make sure that when any to raise automated, so when any pod is down, because use a horizontal auto, um, horizontal auto scaler to make sure that any pod is down, the system is able to stabilize, stabilize it at the same time. Okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> so uh, the application that you work on, uh, that you deploy, uh, what kind of application it is? Mm, it's more of the fintech end of it. People that. Um, so all these cash loan apps, people that um, give soft loan to small businesses, um, end of month salary earners, and all that. So it's more like a fintech kind of application. So I've done a little bit on e-commerce too. Mm -hmm. On e-commerce too, um, where people shop online and all that. I've done a little, a little of e-commerce, but more of fintech I've handled for some period of time. More banking services okay okay um so uh, what is the tech stack behind this application like what language do you use uh, to write uh, this application front end back end yeah we do more bash scripting then because i'm the devops guy mm -hmm. i don't we don't do um we don't i don't do um, in the development part well, we do more of deployment so we do more bash scripting whereby we use bash do more of our more of our commands then we use also YAML, yet another markup language for to do our Kubernetes and manifest. Yeah, uh, that part I understood. I'm just asking like, uh, there would be some code, right? I mean, uh, in some language that this application is written. So what is that language? Java, C sharp, Python. Oh, okay, it draws on Java. Java, yeah, you know, more of Java. Okay. FinTech mostly runs <clears throat> on Java because Java seems to be more secure. Okay. So can you just walk me through uh, all these steps that you have in your pipeline, like one by one uh, till deployment uh, on the Kubernetes cluster, like step by step, what exactly is happening in your pipeline? Okay. So when we get, usually when we get the, we spool it out from Git, mm -hmm. then we move it to, definitely they have created an image and all that to deploy it to a Kubernetes cluster. So whether we design and we'll run our, run our manifest, our YAML manifest file. In the manifest, we also embed the images and all that. 
no no so uh, i mean see by time we apply that see see when you talk about kubernetes that's the end step right um, what is the first step that happens uh, with the code in your pipeline you are doing ci cd right deployment so part times we, we, yes most times we come we do the docker the dockerized small all these things are ready and dockerized already so it's already been dockerized docker far we move it so most of them they have created the image which so dockerized already so we created the image so so through the image we build our manifest our manifest on yaml so with yaml language then we run it through then then we we'll do first testing deployment then pass it through ci cd through um, jenkins okay you are using jenkins right now right you are using jenkins here yeah. okay what is the difference between C- ci and, and cd what is the difference between ci and cd it is continuous integration where um, developers keep merging and changing their codes in in a particular branch usually the main branch mm-hmm. on a daily basis then cd the continuous delivery mm-hmm. where those those um, codes are picked up from the repository and are deployed in are deployed for production yeah a delivery for product delivered for production then there's another one again called them um, continuous deployment or on a regular basis a lot of up releases are coming for us a lot of upgrade are coming forth and we push them also through the pipeline through the process too okay yeah correct so that's what i'm asking in your pipeline whatever you are doing in your current project can you explain me the ci part what exactly happening at the ci part and then cd part so that's what i'm asking what exactly happens at the ci part in your current pipeline okay um in the ci parts we pick up in the ci parts we pick up those um we get the what's it called and um, we run them through that same process using jenkins we make sure that we tell we build we test for bugs and all make sure that what what they put there is not is free of bugs and all that we do a policy analysis and all that before we go ahead and push if there are issues it doesn't run well we have to re- return it back to developers for them to work on it before we be able to move it into it again delivery continuous delivery um see whatever you are answering is answering from like 5000 feet view i want to understand what exactly is happening this let, for example you said that analysis is happening what analysis uh if comp- compilation is happening what exactly is compiling who is compiling what is happening after the compilation i we want to understand compile, we compile all the codes with with we the help of what all the codes with the help of what we use jenkins to compile all jenkins the codes. is a tool ci cd tool there is something inside jenkins that compiles your code jenkins yes. does not compile compile your code so what exactly is that Well, basically i have people that work in that department i do more of monitoring then once the boss advise what then the 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 cc cm the ci cd part of it so, so you I are not more for a promotion and graph and monitoring so you are more into sre role not into devops no i do devops too okay i do devops okay i but... push them through kubernetes down to jenkins to ci cd Okay fine. Um uh, that, that's fine. Um so I can see in your resume that you have worked on uh, Amazon CloudWatch, right? Uh the monitoring part. Right? Mm, we use more I don't use more AWS and um, CloudWatch. We use more of the open source the Prometheus Grafana or um, Elk stack using the Kibana um Okay. monitoring. Okay. So uh let us understand uh, about this CloudWatch. How do you think uh, Amazon CloudWatch differ from AWS CloudTrail? Um, the CloudTrail is more is more it's it monitors who logs in, the other person that logs in, the time that person logs in. So it's more specific. But why CloudWatch is um is more monitoring but Cloud CloudTrail is more detailed. Whoever logs in at any point and whoever makes any changes 
it it trails your transaction from the beginning to the end. So CloudWatch is more like like more visualization views what you're doing, but the cloud trail itself is more detailed. It's more detailed. So when you log in, it seizes you. Whatever you do at location at far you you penetrate, you work on. It's it's very specific. It gets directly at what the exact thing you do, the exact change you make. Cloud Trail follows you all the way down there. But um, Cloud Cloud Watch is more of like a top level overview of what exactly might have gone. It sets up the alerts when it hits a particular threshold and all that. So, but Cloud Trail is more specific. Okay. Basically, uh, when we talk about Cloud Watch, it's monitoring service and it provides you real time monitoring of the AWS resources. When we talk about AWS Cloud Trail, it's a service that records API calls for your AWS account and delivers log file to your Amazon S3 bucket or if you want somewhere else. Okay. Correct. When we talk about the usage, Cloud Watch will monitor perform metrics. It will set your alarms. It will provide visibility into the health of AWS resources. When we talk about cloud trail, it captures okay. the API events, provide an audit trail for actions taken on the resources. You can use them together as oh, well sure. for a comprehensive right. solution. Okay, cool. Uh, by the way, how can you use CloudWatch alarms to automate action based on specific conditions? Mm. Have you used CloudWatch alarms? They've been to CloudWatch, but I can give you an overview. No, it's more Prometheus and Grafana I use, but I could give you a like overview of my own understanding of. But um, you have written in your cloud resume. Watch, don't have that's detail. why. Uh, I mean, in your profile, it was CloudWatch. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. 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 You can give your own. Uh, yeah, I would. Okay, we did prof um, the Prometheus um, Grafana. So we log in on our our EC um, EC2 instance. We try tie to our deployments on our Kubernetes clusters, and we get we have an overview through our Grafana visualization. So from there, we see how our clusters are performing, an overview on how the clusters are performing, and the, po the pods are active, and the pods are, are, are down. If there's a change in the pods, if there's a more um, if there's a um, what's it called? If there's a um, traffic, heavy traffic, we get to view have an overview of everything through our Grafana. So we see when there's a spike and when there's a drop and the way with our CPUs are utilization, whether it's properly run, whether the system is overrunning our memory, to know whether we, whether we, opt, we have to um, do an auto scaling and all that. So it gives us an, even, an overview of what is happening real time as, as our deployments um, are, are running on production. So we have a, a clearer view of everything okay 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 um have you worked on uh, amazon ecs elastic container service elastic container service i do more of um, um more of kubernetes more of kubernetes eks more of eks and more of docker we've not really done i've not retouched really um this year, so we try to do more open source because um, some of these companies want to cut cost on using Amazon all through. So we get to do more of um, more of using containers like Docker, and Docker Hub, instead of going through um, ECS. Then when it comes to Kubernetes, also use um, EKS as the Elastic Kubernetes Services. Okay, to so run, um, run did, our clusters. you didn't mo uh, work much on ECS. Or oh, didn't do much on ECS and ECR. Okay. Internet registry. Okay, no problem. Uh, so in your profile, you have also written uh, AWS Certificate Manager (ACM), right? Mm, yeah, I have a badge on that EKS. No, no. Certificate Manager. Uh, you have written in your profile. Yeah, uh, I have that. You have you have worked on it, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, let's say, uh, how does this um, certificate manager simplify the process of managing SSL, TLS certificates for your application? Yeah, first we have to go to um, um, Route 53 and I have um, 
what's it called a domain name create a domain name which may be company you are paid for so by the time you then you take it to your certificate manager for it to authenticate for it to authenticate it uh -huh. so then if you want to deploy you have to copy it from your but by the time you've done that when you're deploying and uh, we're using your ingress um controller via the load balancer so you get the code from your load balancer then you go back to your app by that time you should have gotten your certificates manager authenticated so you go back to your alpha alpha um, three where you have been able to design the domain name and the link then you click on on the right button make an edit there's a place you enter your load balancer code and paste it there then also um there's another icon you need to make changes i can't remember exactly but as we paste it there then you click on save then automatically automates and that name now appears tied to the tie at the end of the load balancer to connect you to to the end uh, to expose you to the internet so everybody you now use that name you place it on your browser and in the variable your load balancer is a reflection of the your domain name which you're able to certify okay okay basically i just wanted to know the uh, the process of simplifying uh, it so uh, basically acm will automate the um, time consuming tasks uh, like certificate provisioning renewal and deployment because it it will always provide you an integrated yeah. solution for certificate management so that you can eliminate the manual certificate uploads and renewals and stuff so yeah that's that's what uh, that Record. okay uh, so by the way what is a key benefit of uh, using uh, certificate manager over manual certificate management mm, more of automation it makes it faster and the manual one takes it could be a little bit slow but it's more of aws generally everything about this is just more of automation so it makes it quite fast mm -hmm. and speeds up your work rate Okay, yeah. I mean that's a very basic answer. Like, let's say because the primary benefit and is automation. It's more, yeah, it's more, it's more secure too. Automation and it's also more secure too. Okay, I mean to drill down more into it, uh, this will reduce the risk of expired certificate because this simplifies the management process and ensures a secure and a compliant environment. So yeah, that's that's one answer to it. Okay. Um, you have worked on EC two as well, right? Yeah, you see to um, Elastic um, <coughs> and okay. Cloud. What is the difference between on-demand instances? Yeah, okay, what is the difference between on-demand instances, reserved instances, and spot instances? Uh, dear, <laughs> it's very technical. So, um, okay, how on-demand how... instances? Okay, I'm listening to you. So you can go by the name. You want actually, to you can. Ha, yeah. You can go by the name. So what would on-demand instance mean? On-demand is an urgency for you to. Is an urgency as on-demand is. There's a demand for you to quickly use your EC2 instance. It's not something you want to use on a regular basis. So you just go in, use do whatever you want to do, and come out. On the spot is. Is something you want to do immediately, and you know, not something like you're going to last more than for too long. They want to make some corrections and all that. You go in and you come out, that is on the spot. Then the regular one is the one that you have to leave it there, keep so you keep your server running, you keep your network going on, it keeps running on the regular basis, just like that. So, and as it's running, they're billing you for usage, they're billing you for the volume you're consuming, mm -hmm. AWS is billing you for all that. Okay, the correct, uh, I mean, you're correct, but in one line, if you want to explain, it's like pay as you go pricing because there is no upfront cost. And pay as you go, yeah. Okay. That's, that's right, pay as you go, yeah. Uh, what is the reserve instances? No, in reserve instances, maybe you will be reserving a particular instance for a particular period of time. So maybe sometimes you might have to pay ahead or ask the W to reserve for a period of time, just pay ahead. So that they can reserve. So, so by the time you just need it, you go ahead and make use of it. So it's like like the name reserved. Something that has been reserved for you, kept <laughs> somewhere for you. But why should I use reserve instances? What's what's the uh, 
I mean, what I'm getting in uh, return? I could use on-demand instances, right? Yes. Um, in some situations whereby, um, how do I put it now? Maybe a particular IP address or whatever it is you um you want you want to make use of that particular IP address at this particular time and all that and you have to ask for it to be reserved for you maybe um particular client base is familiar or something is familiar with this particular ip address and you don't want to lose that particular IP address. maybe i might have stored a lot of information on that file system and all that so it's put you just put it on reserve so that you don't lose some important file attached to that um that reserve instance i don't know whether i don't know if i'm correct see uh reserve in instances is preferred when you want to have a, a significant cost savings in exchange for a commitment to like one year or three year term it is best for predictable workloads okay that's that's how it is okay um what do you mean by spot instances um, spot instances are instances that like in the emergency you just go in and come out it's not something reserved for you it's just something you want to click on in, work on the system and you come out like on the spots you want to quickly go make some changes and and it's not something you have to leave running for a period of time so it releases a lot of costs not something you want to keep running so it's on the spot see when you use spot instances is basically uh, when you bid for unused ec2 capacity so that it provides potentially substantial cost saving it's basically used for fault tolerant and flexible uh, applications see uh, remember it like this uh, uh, on demand flexibility reserve instance is for predictable and steady workloads and spot instance for cost optimization especially for fault tolerant and flexible applications okay <coughs> Uh, okay uh, let's talk about one more scenario okay by the way how do you enhance the security of ec2 instances and what is the role of security group and network acl in this context okay and the um when it comes to security group they got um, inbound rules and out outbound rules so security group the out the outbound rules are open the inbound routes are not so you have to open up the ports for the inbound routes to work but the acli and that's on your vpc the networking end um do you have to there be both inbound and outbound uh, uh, uh um are open already so but you can need to make further adjustments in case you want to secure your your subnets more often but when it comes to security group the inbound is always closed so you have to open up the ports but the outbound is always um is always open uh, how do you enhance the security that's my only man that's my turn and depending on like when it comes to um the when it comes to um security group and um you're working on maybe ports ports ac and you want to connect with the your server you could go to your and open up the ports at port 80 on your security group to allow it to open your that's on your outbound rule on your on your security group for it to be able to allow it to connect to to the outside like in case you're to your server out to the outside to your client sorry your client base outside so basically just open up the ports at the outbound and inbound rule that's basically that's how you announce your security, making those adjustments. Okay, so see when it comes to enhancing enhance the security for EC2 instances, you can uh, utilize the key pair for secure SSH access. Uh, implementing security patches is another thing. Okay, SSH key gen. Okay. Yeah. I get what you're saying. And I, I don't uh, understand that from that end. You can use IAM roles and. Uh, to grant permission securely so that that's how you can how you can yeah do. i am rule today okay i am rule ssh is key gen i know that okay okay so authenticate oh i didn't know you meant to authenticate yeah 
So, okay, okay, let me give you an instance um, mm -hmm. how I could use like a remote SSH, SSH whereby I need to connect, um, I need to connect to a client. Mm -hmm. So what I do is um, I go do my SSH, um, generate a key pair. Then I, once I generate a key pair, I send it to, to the client, to the client end. So by the time it places there, then make them go to our, my square to back, open up my port, indirectly connect. So by the time he's writing a file on the, on the, on the file is writing, it, so he could also view what I'm doing on my server end. He could see everything I have on my server end through um, SSH key, um, key gen. So I generate a key and I push it. Then he goes to the authorize um, the authorization key and paste it there. So two of us are paired up at the same time. So at the same time, as I'm touching some files on my own end, he's able to view it from his own end. And anything he does from his own end, I can also view from my own end. So using that um, SSH or SSH into him, get, get the IP, the public IP address or private IP address into it, click on it, then he could also view me because the, the synergy is just once I have his own IP address after merging with the key gen, I'll be able to view what's happening at the other end, why I can also view what's happening on my own end. So I didn't know that that's what you actually meant. Okay, okay. We'll also do that for NFS, um, NFS um, the net name network file system is also most the same the same kind of um, kind of connection too. Okay, okay. So in your profile you have written EFS as well, right? Um, so you have worked on it EFS. Yeah, with EFS using them um, the documentation. Yeah, using them um, I've set it up using them um, the the documentation the okay. Kubernetes documentation something i've been able to do so you could always write in writing files on pair systems together whereby you can view my efs and um, my document by efs but okay. i don't my company is always um cost cost um, optimization so you don't usually want to put money out for efs because it comes also with its own cost but using kubernetes and documentation followed by step by step go to iam row do that Go to your ERN, get it pasted there, do a lot of configuration before it sets up using the documentation on Kubernetes. Okay. So what is the difference between Amazon EFS and EBS? And in what scenarios would you choose EFS over EBS? Okay, EFS is an elastic file system. They can have some files I want to save. I could save them. Then EBS, um, maybe I want to save some. Um, do I say images? No, images are objects. And I want to save maybe some database, some some database customers information database. I could save it on EBS. EBS is um, quite easy to to manipulate because they are saved in like more blocks, so it is easily accessible. I can always pull out an information from EBS without altering the entire system. But EFS, if I want to pull up, I have to bring down the entire system and um, take out what I want. So there's a major difference between EBS and EFS. So preferably, come, depending on what your what kind of role, what of job you're doing, what you're actually saving, because you mostly prefer using EBS, but easily accessible without altering anything. So they're all in the form of blocks. So close pull without altering, but EFS, I have to bring down the entire thing and pull out what documents I want from the file system. Okay. Um, just to add more uh, to it, basically EFS uh, is a scalable file storage service that can be mounted on uh, multiple EC2 instances concurrently. Okay. It's basically suitable for the application with shared access requirements. Okay. When you, when, when you want to share the access requirements. While in terms of EBS, uh, it provides a block level storage volumes to use with EC2 instances. Okay, basically suitable for scenarios with high performance, low latency is required. I think it's costly as well. Uh, when we talk about the choice, yeah. So when we talk about the choice, uh, you should always choose EFS when multiple EC2 instances need shared access. So basically there are multiple instances and they need a shared access to the same file right. system. And you should choose EBS uh, when individual EC2 instance required a dedicated high performance block storage. Also, it's costly, which I just told. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, Let's talk about one more scenario. Uh, do you know how uh, EFS handle data con- consistency in multi AZ envi- uh, AZ deployment and why it is important for applications with multiple instances? Sorry, sorry, coming in. I didn't get your question. Do you know sorry. how does EFS Can you say it again? EFS handle data consistency in multi AZ deployment? Mm-hmm. I'm not so familiar with that aspect of it, but I could try. Okay. Um, I could, I could, I could give it a shot. Um, EFS, we could auto, which is auto scaling, more of auto scaling, whereby files are down, and um, auto scaling, more of auto scaling, um, kind of um scenario, whereby it's being set on the do the, the auto scaling whereby if some files are down there's a backup so that once the backup that like, replicates it on on another pod and all that so i'm not so familiar but i know that's more of, to keep files consistency on all of, we have to auto scale over, over that period of time so that we don't lose any information out there okay before going into that, um, in okay before going deep into it do you understand what exactly it means by data consistency in in case of efs yeah, more persistence in your persistence in your storage data consistency, persistence in the, more of um, persistent storage. You for you, your your files are always backup. They are not um, compromised in any way. They are well stored. So at any point in time, you can also always reach out to it and can also share among other users. Okay. When we talk about strong data consistency in a multi AZ environment, it means that if you do changes in one AZ, they are immediately visible to the other instances in different AZs. So that's what we meant by data consistency. And EFS achieves this through something known as NFS V 4.1 protocol. Okay. I mean, last time I checked, it was this. And because of this, it's ability to seamlessly replicate data across multiple AZ zones. This ensures your consistency and reliability. So that's, that's how AZs work. Okay. Uh, how comfortable are you in Git? Well, I'm more of the git from the ACLI end of it, so more of the git merge, git <coughs> branch. So yeah, to a reasonable extent, I'm more of them. Really, well, well, I could do averagely well on the git on the git end of it. Um, more of on the git, um, ACLI the of the okay. Whereby I could Apart do a lot of filing on with git on my base machine. Okay. before we push to the repository okay apart from git have you ever worked on any version control system mm, cryo okay so like first of all what exactly is git what do you understand by git mm, the version control system where developers um, log in their do a lot of um, logging their software codes and also make changes subsequently over time and by time um, they are true and all that um, the DevOps guys go their spool and what they have so it's more of it's tied to our CI CD um, um, GM, CIS coordinate integration coordinate deployment work so the version control system whereby all developers putting their do all of their changes they match to a particular branch so it's virtually tied to the ci cd um, job function so okay uh what is the difference between git and github um, the github is a is a hub more like a hub then the visualize and it has a g the gui gui of git is more of git github whereby the git itself is is the cli the command line interface whereby all those commands are that worked on whereby you create your file touch your file could do your your git commits and all that your git add your git commit on your cli part so it's more of more of um uh, what's it called the terminal kind of work you do there but the github itself is like 
is a visualizer, a graphical user interface. It makes it look very good, so it's more of easily accessible. Yes, that's so, so that's the difference between Git and GitHub. Okay. And they also they all work together. This is sync. Okay. Uh, when we say that um, Git, okay, by the way, Git is distributed or uh, non centralized. <coughs> Sorry? Git is distributed or Git centralized? Is non-centralized. Sorry? Is non-centralized. It means it's distrib distributed. Sorry. Distributed, right? What what does that supposed to mean? Distributed? Yeah, it's an open source. Right? <laughs> confusing. Git Git is I'm um, sorry. Git is distributed. Git is it GitHub or Git Git you're talking about? Sorry. Yes, Git is I'm distributed. Is it GitHub or Git? Not GitHub, only Git. Git is distributed. What does this supposed to mean? What is the meaning of this? Git distributed. Uh, maybe I, 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 most of them I use them. Maybe I don't actually know the true meaning of what I'm doing. But when you say Git is distributed, whereby when you have a branch and you key it in, the git is booted, so you have a, a branch and you key it in, someone else can also view what you have on your git branch, so it's quite, it's quite a distributed because people can always key in through the branch system that is at your git distribution. See the very uh, basic meaning of distributed is each developer in the team has a local copy of the entire repository. And this enables offline work and faster operation. That's that's all the meaning of distributed, which was not in case of SVN because SVN subversion is centralized. You do not have a local copy. Okay. Um, do you know what is the meaning of branching strategies? Yeah, I have not meaning of branching strategies. One of the strategies in developer use we could also call it trunk, trunk and. Mm. You have branch structure, you also call it trunk strategy, feature, and git flow. Mm. So the one of the branch one of the branch branching strategy is the one we call the trunk, whereby all developers merge and make their change their changes on a particular branch on the main branch, or we call it on the main on the main branch. Then the other one is features, feature branch, whereby if the particular changes that need to be made is, is found, you could do them on the future branch. They also have the one that they call them um, hotfix. Is an emergency, they need to make some quick corrections. They go to use the one for the hotfix. So those are under those are also same other feature branches too. Then we have the Git flow. It's like comprises of the whole the whole flow of the, how everything works, intertwined. But then, um, yeah, let's have a full idea of how Git flow works. But I know about the Git branch, sorry, the trunk kind of branch and um, branch strategy, and also the feature and um, branch strategy too. Okay, so which branch goes to the production? What goes to the production is the trunk. Trunk goes to production. That's where the main, where the main change. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> the git flow goes to production. Trunk is dev, right? Dev branch, develop branch, if I'm not wrong. Trunk is developer, yeah. Trunk is developer branch, yeah, correct. Okay, uh, so you, you cut out. Trunk is developer branch. You cut out feature branch from which branch? You cut out feature branch from the main branch. Is there a difference between main branch and master branch? Or do you have only one branch? No, the master branch is the main branch. Brother branch is the main branch. It can also be called the trunk branch. Then why would you cut a uh, feature branch from a uh, main branch? No, you don't cut a feature branch from the main branch. You just the said feature branch is a branch. Sorry, the feature branch is a branch. It does the sub the subset of the main branch where changes where if there's a feature they need to add to it. That's where the changes are made before they now move it move it into production. You also have the one of um, hotfix. 
uh, for maybe they quickly need to make changes, adjustments immediately. And that one too, those ones are the branch as well attached to the main branch. Okay, do you understand what is an hotfix branch? Yeah, I have a fair idea of what happens in the hotfix. Okay. Hotfix, okay. hotfix branch. So there are multiple scenarios in which we take hotfix branch from master branch. Just give me one scenario. Okay. Um, let me give you an instance. Assuming them. Fix or fix. There's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a feature that's oh sorry no this feature that would um this hot fix is um so like an emergency they need to change maybe there's a there's a there's 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 a there's a, if there's a what's it called oh sorry so one second let me put my words together. Maybe there's a but ah uh, the system is no, no system is down no no my system is down ah uh, I know I have it somewhere but I can't can't remember but it's some that is done an emergency they need to quickly make quick adjustments that's why they call the hot fix like clean need to make an immediate correction but an example on my head now. <sighs> Okay, yeah, I mean, that's more relevant. So let's say if you have uh, given a release to some uh, client and something goes haywire in, in the production and you immediately need to fix it. So you do not go through dev, stage, prod. You do yeah. not go that yeah. way. You just take a hotfix branch from the master branch, fix it and then down merge it. Go and down to the uh, really stage, bad. then UAT and then dev. That's that's how you done. It's uh, uh, mm. It's one of the strategies. It's called back merging. Okay. Okay. So I have come to your favorite topic now, uh, Grafana. Okay. So, um, let's say, uh, okay, let's start from the very basic. Uh, how does Grafana contribute to monitoring and visualization in DevOps environment? Oh, Grafana contributes, it helps in visualizing um, what happens from the system generally, how What's um, what's running on your clusters? So it's more of because it's more of deployments. What's happening in the in the production and environment? Whereby it visualizes the traffic on the system, make sure that them security no no them on on using no strange IP address is um is encroaching the system and all that. So it's virtually an an overview of um your production um, environments and overview of what happens in the production environment so when there's a spike you see it up there more of a graphical a gui graphical user interface too so something that you can always visualize okay so did you create your own dashboards uh, or did you use any plugin sort of thing oh well, we created our own um, dashboard from and through our, through our clusters. Okay. Okay, I'll add more to it. So basically, it's an open source platform for obviously monitoring and observability. Uh, dashboards are customizable and uh, you can integrate it with, with various data sources like CloudWatch, Prometheus. It's very common, Grafana and Prometheus. Uh, Elasticsearch. Yes. Uh, so they'll consolidate the data into unified interface for analysis and troubleshooting. It's It's great, actually. Um, uh, also uh, it's, it's critical, uh, for the real time visibility, uh, trend analysis, anomaly detection, a lot of stuff. Uh, so tell me a scenario in which you integrated with some, what data source? Um, the data source I use integrate is a more of, um, a fleet money come kind over of traffic, um, more of like, um, what's it called? The traffic, um, a dispatch kind of a UPS, a courier delivery kind of stuff. So we always to monitor the movement of the particular package all through the routes and check um, um, customers and um, customers inflow and um, movement of um, vehicles and all that on the on the platform. I don't know whether I, I don't I don't know why I understood your question very well. 
ओके नो प्रॉब्लम ओके कूल डू नो व्हाट इज ग्रफाना प्लगइन्स आई डोंट यूज ग्रफाना प्लगइन आई जस्ट यूज द डेमो द वंस आई स्पू फ्रॉम फ्रॉम इट योर्स आई नॉट ट्राइंग नो यूज देम ग्रफाना प्लगइन्स then how were you uh, create how did you create the dashboard and how did you visualize uh, in the dashboard grafana oh, dashboard yeah i had to spool, i just sorry i spool the plugins from my had to run it through my through my clusters so um so that i connected to to my prometheus in grafana uh, um, grafana um, plugins i got them to the grafana cloud okay okay so I'll just walk you through. So, Grafana plugins is basically the uh, extension that can enhance the functionality of Grafana. Uh, they can provide additional data sources, panel types, integration. Uh, that's that's pretty much about it. Okay. Uh, so, CI/CD tool that you were using is Jenkins, right? CI/CD tool Jenkins. Okay. Um. Okay. So, what exactly is Jenkins? Um, Jenkins is a tool, is a more of an automation tool. for your continuous integration and continuous um deployment is fully main fully main to be is fully automated to so, so keep monitoring deployments and then um, delivery so and it connects straight to your gen um, it connects to the to the gates and also connects to your kubernetes clusters and you have an element of it connected to your to your docker so Like I'm more like three arms of mm-hmm. of and um, your Jenkins, so it's more of a tool that picks up all this and routes it to your CI/CD um okay configuration. Okay. Um. In what language Jenkins is re- is written? More of like um Jenkins written in Java. So there has to be a Marvin. There has to be a Java Marvin tool. Okay. Is it open it's source download. or paid? Jenkins. Sir. Jenkins is what? open source or a paid software? Is open is open is open Jenkins is open source that's why it's very popular a lot of people want to use because it's the okay. open source. Okay. Okay. So if I have some problem in Jenkins and I have to reach out uh, to someone to help me out is there any body that controls it uh, where I can reach out? Well I you should have a maybe a customer base you need you can reach out with but um I've never encountered where we need to talk to somebody to reach out to someone then but I I know Jenkins and the more an open source and application Okay Have you ever heard about cloud bees um, cloud bees I've heard about cloud bees but I've no use cloud bees Okay so when we talk about Jenkins in the enterprise we talk about cloud bees okay just i mean you can google through it so basically cloud bees ci it. is your solution for jenkins in the enterprise okay uh, you can uh, google cloud bees more uh, you will learn about it okay okay, okay uh, explain me the concept of uh, jenkins pipelines and how do they improve management of complex build and deployment processes The purpose of Jenkins pipeline. Many have asked me that question before, and I didn't do well that question. So Jenkins pipeline is um, when you integrate your more of your CI/CD, when you pull it out from your from your Kubernetes and um, from your Kubernetes clusters, and you set it up, make sure that your deployment files and everything that there are no bugs and not um, issues, then it builds it it tests it it runs it and it deploys okay okay uh what is the difference between upstream and downstream job sir say again what is the upstream difference between downstream upstream and downstream job oh um upstream and downstream job i'm not familiar with that sorry so sorry i didn't get catch you What did you say? I I did not it's understand. You said what's the difference between upstream and downstream job? Yeah, I said I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, like, uh, what what does it do? 
I mean, what is the difference between an upstream and downstream job? Difference. I'm talking. Oh, okay. What well, difference between upstream and downstream job is a um, um, system whereby. Um, sorry, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, See, uh, when you talk about downstream job, it means when you're uh, in your pipeline or something. Uh, when you have, let's say, A, B, C, D. Okay, and that's the pattern you have to follow. So when A jobs completes, the downstream job is B. B will only run uh, when A has run. But you can transform that as well. I mean, uh, you can configure in such a way that it will any time run. That's configurable. But downstream job means yeah, that it can time. only run when the previous job runs. Similarly, we have an upstream job. So for example, A B C D, A is an upstream job for B. B is an upstream job, a downstream job for A. For that's a. that's how it works. Okay, uh, what is the difference between declarative and uh, scripted pipelines? Mm, declarative pipelines, uh, scripted pipelines are the ones that are scripted are programmed already, so they move based on what scripted like an instruction has already given. Declarative is them. Um, declarative is different from scripted, whereby. Um, if there are issues, it slows down. It's not, it's not more of a, it's semi-automated, more of that. But the scripted pipeline is fully automated. It goes through the script and moves um, seamlessly. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's talk about Kubernetes now. Okay, uh, and this would be my last topic for today. I'll mix the question with Kubernetes and EKS. Okay. That's fine. What That's exactly fine. is Kubernetes and how does it simplify the deployment and management of containerized application? Yeah, Kubernetes is, an, uh, um, is, um, is more of use for orchestration, uh, whereby you have large volumes of application you need to deploy. That's why it's called Kubernetes cluster. So it's able to manage large volume of application and and handle the containerization and all that so that they all move seamlessly. They are mostly used for microservices kind of application, whereby it's a different guy like, by having monolithic and microservices. Microservices whereby you can always work on a particular aspect of an application, you can work on, a, on an application without it affecting the entire system in the in the cluster. So Kubernetes actually makes work seamlessly because you could absorb a lot of application at the same time. And all of them working um, seamlessly. And um, more of um, how do I put it? Um, it makes work fast. It makes work easy. Less error. And um, yeah, then yeah, I could go more talking about replacement of nodes. The using the the um, the controller, the scheduler that schedules the job, and all that. So. Okay, I don't know. There's another question you can ask me. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, how does EKS simplify the deployment and management of Kubernetes cluster? Yeah, EKS is more of a um, license is automated already. Instead of this, more is the cloud technology is automated. It's different from when you use your Cube ADM that is on premise. So EKS manages the manages the master node and the worker nodes. All along together without a lot of things happening at the background where you don't see schedules, all the activities going on with the kubelet from the node connecting to the master node. So it automates generally it automates everything from the background. So it makes work kind of fast and seamless. So you don't get to know that there's a lot of work happening in the background. Then when you're using your premise, your cube ADM and all that, you get to see you have to man uh, manually do all this by yourself. Okay, okay. Can you explain me the role of uh, worker nodes in an EKS cluster and how you can scale them? Okay, yeah. Worker nodes are mostly where more of your deployment, your application are embedded where they, where they are, where they are. And the way it's designed with um, EKS, EKS nodes, when any node is fails, it auto-generates. Like, it's it's, it's, it regenerates another one immediately and it moves all information immediately, it replicates all information immediately into that particular one. So, and in case you want to scale, want to scale up your node, depending on whether the traffic, there's a lot of 
people traffic on your your nodes that is killing up your maybe your code because when they switch traffic and maybe the cpu utilization cannot absorb those kind of traffic you could also the horizontal um port auto scaling so so it makes you make sure that um at every point in time if there's push traffic it generates um a lot uh, more more ports to absorb traffic if traffic goes down some of those ports also and um, goes off so i can set it up i can now set it up on the system whereby you view it real time online whereby the when the nodes are when the ports are going down you see when the ports when there's more traffic it regenerates itself again so that's a fair idea why i know about eks node and how to scale it up okay um generally worker nodes when we talk about these are generally ec2 instances in the eks cluster responsible for running the pods uh, they communicate with kubernetes control plane to manage the deployment of containers when we talk about the scaling part specifically, you can auto uh, utilize ASGs, auto scaling group, to automatically adjust the number of worker nodes based on demand. Okay. Um, so, can you explain with the architecture of uh, Kubernetes? Okay, we'll explain the architecture of Kubernetes, whereby we have the the main, the main, um, the main, and we have the worker node, the main node, and we have the worker nodes. So in the main we have the we need it, we have the scheduler, then we have the controller at the top, then we have the um, what's it called? The cube API on the other side. Then by the other side we have the workers. The workers have the cube the cube um the cubelets. The cubelets actually connects to the to the main to, uh, the cubelets are actually found in the worker end. That connects that speaks to the to the main to the main um, to the main node by the API QB and the cube API. So then we also have them um, the cube proxy mm -hmm. that generates connects that has a network that links up from the from the worker nodes to the to the main node. Why the the nodes can get which is on the main on the main node actually is the one that's schedules jobs at a very point in time so it's more like a big let me give you, let me give you like a simple example more like a mother ship that has all the containers in it and the small ships that comes to lift containers and distribute like that like not a fairly like layman kind of example where we have a mother ship that has all the containers coming on board but can't get into the other side of the sea because it's still on the high sea but the smaller, well, that's, so that's, that's like, like like an example of how it works between the main, the main and node and the worker nodes, the master node and the worker nodes where they come. So the scheduler is one that schedules each container, each work that needs to be placed on the smaller ship. So those like that, like my mom, little my illustration, how I could explain it to a layman that they're trying to understand the whole architecture of how the the Kubernetes and this thing work, the Kubernetes architecture works. Okay, okay. Uh, what do you understand by a namespace in Kubernetes? Yeah, namespace is used to distinguish and to differentiate between all our deployments or a particular deployment. Maybe like have an application that is running for it not to have clashes with other kind of applications. We use namespace to differentiate these this one and um, this particular application from the other application. So namespace is more of like um like called like nomenclature, what we call it in in, in science is is a nomenclature where it differentiates between this application and other application so that you don't get to have um so they don't have to um have a lot of clashes like misunderstood and that like like that not for them to have misunderstand like name namespace. So namespace is distinguished these and that so okay 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 so this would be my last question for today uh, explain me the workflow in kubernetes okay um, the workflow from kubernetes is it using eks anything kubernetes eks aks gke anything <laughs> so kubernetes 
let me use EKS, setting it up on my, how to set it up on my system. What mm -hmm. I do is um, I, I set up my system. I go to AWS EKS mm -hmm. and I create my Kubernetes. Cluster. Uh, complete okay. my cluster. Uh -huh. It takes some time, maybe 10 minutes or uh, 7, 10 minutes roughly. Okay. Then when it comes up, I go to compute. I click on compute and I enter in my, my loop. But before that, I have I picked up my subnet, my networking, my VPC, I'm going to arrange them when I'm filling up, when I'm building my Kubernetes. So when I come, I pick up my node and I click on EKS node, give it a name, and I select the role. This is maybe worker role on my on my this thing so it runs for like maybe five to seven minutes there about for it to create so before i put it on my base machine on my on my terminal i also have to make sure that i configure my terminal to be aw aws and cli to make mm -hmm. sure that it works perfectly on aws cli mm -hmm. so by the time i put it there then i also go to my aws config to set up my role my i am role whereby i do my and by the time i get my my access keys, I key in, I write AWS config, mm -hmm. I enter my uh, my region and all that, I key them in and enter button. Now, at the same time, I also have to verify that I actually enter. After setting up my AWS CLI, so it shows that, okay, my, my I'm the one that is running it at this point in time. And then what I go back to, I go to my Kubernetes um, documentation and configure my system to um, from that Kubernetes um, Kubernetes um, Cubes CTL. I've got on Cube CTL. Usually, what we use now is Cube CTL 1.28. So I make sure I copy the documentation and I paste it on my terminal for it to build. By the time it has built, before that time, I've expected my nodes to have formed, to have generated already. So I go to my instance and verify and make sure that my nodes are already working and running. So before I start using my my base machine start working on my kubernetes i make sure that i set up my security group to align with my nodes so that it will be easier for me when i'm working so i go set up my security group open up necessary ports that i'm going to work with then i go back to my to my base machine then i say cube and i say aws eks mm -hmm. update cube config my region my Kubernetes name, that's my EKS name, then I click enter. It automatically with adding to there, adding mm -hmm. to Kubernetes there. Then I say kubectl get node. I see that all my nodes are ready mm -hmm. and they're active working. From there, I move on with my deployment and I create my simple deployment file and use my this is my using yaml language as in okay. Uh, okay okay i would like to stop you right there uh, so whatever you just told me is not exactly the workflow it's basically how do you create a cluster inside eks which is correct okay I mean, yeah the maybe, process maybe is I correct. Understand your question. yeah so the answer is correct it's just uh it's for a different question like how do you create an eks cluster it's correct 100 percent correct i'm looking more for a workflow See, as a developer, as a DevOps or an SRE, you create a manifest file, right? That's the first step. What happens after yeah, that? Yeah, manifest file, yeah. yeah. What happens after that? Um, after manifest, after I create my manifest file, as that is control minus F, my YAML file, it creates by itself. By the time you create by itself, but it depends on if I want to make a deployment, I want to, I want to do run an, a cluster IP or I want to do a node port. So if I'm going, I'm not going to run a node, a node port, where I put my port on my manifest file, which is already written there. So I have to do like a testing to be sure that the image I have there is is good, is, is up and running. So I run a node, a node port on it, and I get the my IP address where the worker node is on. Then I paste it on my browser. I put that, and I find find out that okay, this um my image on my manifest file is is running accurate. So with that alone. I've I've left that, so I move straight to working on my um what's it called the ingress control and the load balancer because I still have to go back and edit that node port because I wanted to be sure that okay I've tested that this then um, the image is good and the browser is fine so I go back there and edit edit that and put cluster IP because I'm going to use my ingress to run it so I go back and set up the 
what's it called my ingress and um, file i just i use um, the kubernetes um, documentation to set up the ingress and all that then when i'm done with that i make all necessary corrections from that yaml file i change my arn i work on my ci cdr and all those by the time i set up all those things then i run it and i also create another tool file because when i'm going to make deployment using them um, my ingress controller actually i have to create three yaml file deployment file yaml file then the file i'm going to use to for my own my load balancer so i'm going to place all those my load balancers so this guy does have like the, the process flow where okay. i have to go back to my r53 to make the changes in the name and do key my load balancer on my r53 to make sure that it corresponds with the the um, okay. deployment i'm working on okay so basically, if I talk from 5,000 feet view, so the first step is your user or a developer or a DevOps guy. Uh, it defines the desired state in the application using Kubernetes manifest. The next step is the API server. It accepts and processes your manifest storing them in etcd. Third step would be controller manager and scheduler, which monitor changes in the etcd and work to reconcile the desired state uh, in the with the actual state. Then comes into picture your kubelet. On each node, it ensures the containers are running according to the pod manifest. Then comes your net service proxy or networking that manages the network traffic and exposes services within the cluster. That's 10,000 feet view. All right. Um, yeah, I think I'm done.